Hello everyone, this is Constance from Mysterious Galaxy. Tonight, I am very excited because we, we have a love, well, a love story with tension, dare I say, and maybe some family tension and curses and whatnot, but we have Just Our Luck, and it is by Julia Walton, who is not in the middle, but on my other, there we go, there we go, and she is going to be in conversation with Kathleen Glasgow. I almost just put your first and your last name together. <laughs> and I am super excited. Before they get into it, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our authors and give you the old Vanna White section of where everything is, and then I will pass it off to Kathleen. So Julia Walton is the author of the award-winning Words on Fact Room Walls. She received an MFA in Creative Writing from Chapman University and a BA in History from UC Irvine. And Julia lives with her husband and children in California. I feel like it seems strange to put where you live. <laughs> so I'm just going to leave it there. And then Kathleen Glasgow's first novel was a New York Times bestselling novel, Girl in Pieces. How to Make Friends with the Dark is her second novel, and she lives in Madison, Arizona. And then um, for both of them, if you want to know, you can follow them on social media. If you click where it says purchase book and sign book plates, we have their author bios that have all of their information, as well as where you can indeed purchase both of the author's books, and you can even get a signed book plate, which is pretty snazzy if you ask me. So as I kind of hinted at, this is a love story that doesn't start out as a love story. And I am really excited to get to hear Kathleen and Julia talk about it. Before I disappear though, as everyone almost knows, we have our lovely conversation section to the right hand side. Hello everyone, hello to all the hellos. And then if you have any questions for the authors, make sure you ask, this is your time to get to ask whatever questions you have. So if you look right down below where it says, ask a question that is indeed where you can ask a question just make sure you click that and then you submit, can submit your questions for the authors and i'm going to go ahead and pass it off to kathleen i'll see you guys at the end of the event bye hi everyone thanks for coming and i'm really excited to talk to julia walton about her new book and first let me apologize about the glare on my glasses but i have to wear them or i can't see also my dog might show up at some point so you know be gentle so <laughs> I'm a big fan of words on bathroom walls, which by the way, was made into a motion picture and it's streaming now, so go watch it. And so I was very excited to read Julia's second book, Just Our Luck, and it blew me away. It's discussion of anxiety, masculinity, which we should talk about a little bit, uh, hot yoga, bad luck, and family curses. It's a beautifully written book about Leo and his story immediately like sucked me in. His voice is particular, it's sensitive, and above all else, it is he is laugh out loud funny. His perspective on the world is generous and caustic and sarcastic, but never less than tender. And this is a fabulous book. And I thought that we would start today by having Julia read a little bit from it. Awesome. Okay, um, I will read the first chapter for you. Thank you, Kathleen. You're um, and yeah, I'll go ahead and read the first chapter for you guys. Um, I don't have my fancy red glasses today. They are getting fixed and getting new frames, so sorry. And <laughs> I'm going to read this one for you. And please pardon the glare. Ooh, there is a little bit. Here we go. Chapter one, I didn't lie, not really. I just didn't provide all the details. Yaya would have said that lying's, that's lying too because you can feel it in your stomach when you're holding something back. Not holding back was the problem though because I lunged at him first. I just didn't tell anybody that. And I should have known better. It was rule number one of the two rules that Yaya drilled into my head before she died. Rule number one, bad luck follows lies like Apamu. Rule number two, leave the Paros family alone. Yes, he hit me, but that's not the full story, and it would be lying to say that it wasn't just a little bit my fault. The thing with anxiety is that people think it makes you run from a fight, but that's not always true, at least not for me. Sometimes it makes you defensive. What happens for me is that when that hot, panicky feeling rises up, I just need to get it out of my system. Like, sometimes the easiest thing to do, the easiest way to do that is to be a jerk. Lash out as quickly as possible to get that instant relief of setting the bad thing free. 
Just as long as it leaves me alone. As long as it's not gnawing on the hardware in my brain, I'm cool. Anyway, it's actually the school's fault this happened. Service hours are required, and I've always signed up for the jobs that are mostly solitary, like reshelving library books. But this time they assigned us jobs, and someone thought it would be a good idea for me to sell candy at the snack shack. It was the first day back from winter break, so of course the place was swarming with people holding their sweaty money from the holidays, trying to elbow their way to the cash register. And I was behind the counter, responsible for giving them the sugar to keep this orgy of energy going. Jesus Christ, what have I done to deserve this? I kept telling myself it was only for today, but as more people filled the room, I started to hear a loud buzzing in my ears. All the Sour Patch Kids went first, then the fresh cookies, then the Starbursts. One guy, Jordan Swansea, gave me $40 for three big containers of red vines and told me to keep the change as he walked out and distributed them in handfuls to the rest of, the imp of his impossibly tall group of jock friends. Overpaying for red vines in the snack shack just so you can drop money on the counter in front of everyone and walk away is a classic symbol of douchebaggery. That's probably unfair, but he has that kind of vibe. Maybe it's not such a big deal for rich people, I wouldn't know. My high school sits in the middle of a lot of wealthy neighborhoods, so even though my family has always been solidly middle class, that almost translates to poor here. That's what I was thinking when Drake Gibbons, the second douchebag of the day, got to the front of the line. As I was counting back change, he interrupted me. I should probably note that he does that a lot. Interrupts, I mean. He's been in my class since his family moved here in third grade, and he has always been annoying. He doesn't really have a filter, which means he was usually responsible for the truest and meanest nicknames doled out in elementary school. I was doing fine trying to ignore the noise and people, but instead of waiting for me to finish, Drake grabbed a cliff bar, dropped a wrinkled 20 into the cash box, and said, 19, dude. I would have pegged him for a Slim Jim kind of guy. Just a sec. I was still helping this girl who was trying to pick out all the green Jolly Ranchers, all the green apple Jolly Ranchers from the plastic box in front of her. But Drake didn't want to wait for his change. Hey, dude, let me help you with that. He tried to reach into my cash box and I pulled it back. Just a sec, I'm not done with that. Jolly Rancher Girl, who also went by Cassie and was in my algebra class, was taking her sweet ass time pulling out her candy and I was trying to move her along while Drake kept putting his hand over the counter to grab his change. It wasn't clicking for him that I was still helping someone else. Like he heard me, but he didn't hear me, if that makes any sense. Dude, I'll help you, it's 19 bucks. He was still leaning over the counter, still in my space, close enough for me to smell the protein shake on his breath. Cassie glared at him, but he ignored her too. Just wait, I said, gritting my teeth. I put my put up my hand. The noise in the room was giving me a stomach ache, and I had to turn start over, counting back change for the second time. Then Drake stage whispered, uh-oh, better not make Fat Leo mad. I glared at him. Fat Leo was the best nickname he could have given me as a kid. Since I, subs since I subsisted on a diet of moussaka and souvlaki and my pudgy belly stretched most of my clothes, Fat Leo was a suitable choice, I guess, but completely without vision. He swiped for the cash box, and Cassie once again tried to get me to finish her transaction, and that's when the crowd turned ugly. Some of us are hangry. Just give me my Funyuns, dude, said a guy in the back, and breath mint, said his girlfriend. A bunch of people laughed, but a few other people started sounding really annoyed about the holdup. The laughter rumbled in my head, making it feel like my temples had a heartbeat. Why am I here around people and not hiding in a dark corner? Why isn't that a service hours option? There was another grab for the cash box, and as I yanked it out of Drake's reach, I could see people watching with curiosity. Jesus, said Drake, just let me grab my change. The sound reverberated in my head like a microphone screeching with audio feedback. Dude, you got a 57 on your last math test. Do you think I trust you to figure out your own change? I could see immediately that it was embarrassing to him. I handed Cassie her change and then counted out his 19 bucks slowly, deliberately. Then someone pushed him out of the way, but I didn't see him until, and I didn't see him until later that afternoon. I had a study period before gym. Instead of wandering to the library as usual, I found one of three spots normally unoccupied by people in a hall just outside the computer lab. I pulled out some blue chenille yarn and started crocheting a mati. The mati was the first thing I'd ever learned to make. It's a black circle in a blue circle surrounded by a white circle, an eye that Greeks put up to keep the devil away, to ward off bad luck. I was going to leave this one at Yaya's grave. I put all my focus into making small, even stitches, even though I totally heard Drake when he walked up to me. I ignore people when I'm focused, especially since my mind was still running from the snack shack incident. In the grand scheme of things, it's just one guy being kind of a dick, but anxiety, remember? Sometimes small stuff hits big. Hey man, that was kind of messed up what you did today. I didn't even look up, didn't even try to acknowledge him until he pulled my yarn out of my hands. That's when I lost it. I didn't hit him, but I did lunge forward and swipe for my yarn, which he was holding near his face, and since it probably looked like I was going to hit him, he hit me first, in the face. In movies, they make it look so easy for the hero to get beaten to a gross, bloody pulp and then instantly get back to fighting, but they underestimate pain. Or maybe it's just that my soft, squishy body could not deal with the slow-motion bulldozing from Drake's fist. 
He is way faster and bigger and stronger. He probably didn't know what to do once when he actually knocked me down, but he did run for the nurse. And even before I hit the ground, I knew my lip would be a meaty disaster. I can only hope the blood that pooled around my body scarred him for life, but then I passed out. Being unconscious at the time, I can't really know for sure. The janitor was the first person I saw when I woke up. I heard him mutter something about the mess he had to clean up. Nice. There were no other witnesses. It was just me and my rap sheet of other incidents that labeled me as a problem, even though all those other incidents were bad stuff happening to me. Guess they read, guess they read that as bad stuff happening because of me, because I mostly just want to be left alone. And for some reason, that makes other guys with nothing better to do go, let's piss on his backpack and see if he notices. The best part was that when the principal called my dad was when the principal called my dad in to talk. It wasn't my first time being called into the principal, but it was the first time in high school. And since I'm a junior now, I'm a little surprised it took this long. Middle school was another story, though. It had been a shitstorm of counselor visits and principal interventions that never seemed to end because people, i.e. other kids, always want to get a reaction from the quiet kid, even when the quiet kid isn't bothering anyone. I couldn't hear the beginning of the conversation through the door, but eventually I knew it wasn't going well when dad started muttering loudly in Greek. Translated, this is what he said. What he, need, what he needs is to stop acting so sensitive and misunderstood. He needs to learn how to deal with people, or at the very least, how to defend himself. Why did this happen? Dad finally said in English. And the next part I heard clear as a bell. So did everyone else in the administ administration office, because the principal had been trying without success to speak over my dad's muttering, and he forgot to use his inside voice. Leo doesn't get along with his peers. The secretary behind the counter jumped a little and then looked over, looked over at me, pretended nothing had happened. I guess I had to guess all the other things the principal was probably telling my dad that he already knew. That I already knew, though, because he lowered his voice again. Things like, Leo doesn't play well with others. Leo doesn't participate in any school activities. Leo keeps to himself. Leo struggles with group assignments and presentations. Leo knits a lot. The last one is when my dad would have died of shame. Even though Yaya was his mom, she taught me to knit. She basically taught me how to do anything and everything with yarn and most fibers, and he will never forgive her for it because it's not something men do. Well, it's not something they're supposed to do. This might help you relax, Agapimu. Yeah, yeah, said. It is relaxing, but I probably shouldn't have been doing it at school. I shouldn't do anything that draws attention. I shouldn't do anything I have to explain because then I have to invite, because then I invite people in. It's like asking them to comment on something I enjoy, like a guy riding a unicycle down the street. Maybe leave him the fuck alone. Ride your, re ride your weird one-wheeled human conveyance machine, dude. Anyway, that's what happened. I got into a fight with Drake, and my dad had to come get me from school. He drove me home with the tissue shoved up my nose, and neither of us spoke the entire ride, which wasn't, unu wasn't unusual since we don't speak much anyway. But there was a moment when the principal asked, asked me what happened, and I didn't say anything about how I'd swiped at Drake first. I didn't say that it had been a preemptive strike. I just said, he hit me. Which, like I said, wasn't a lie, but it wasn't really the whole truth either, and you can always feel those kinds of lies when they sneak out like they're hiding under your tongue, just waiting for the opportunity to escape. Now I have to meet with Drake in the guidance counselor's office to work through our differences, because even though Drake punched me and the principal was clearly concerned about my knitter, loner, quiet kid label and wanted, and wanted someone to keep an eye on me. So yeah, Drake was a douchebag, but maybe I could have handled it differently. Maybe if I hadn't gotten, to, maybe if I hadn't gotten so defensive, maybe I wouldn't have said that. Maybe I could have been nicer. Fuck, how did this happen? Okay, so the beginning of this book, which you just read from, really sets up all the competing difficulties in Leo's life. We know that his grandmother is gone. We know that he's being bullied at school. We know that he doesn't have a great relationship with his dad. We know that he has anxiety. And what I love about your writing is how you so eloquently talk about people with mental illness, particularly teens. And you did this in Words on Bathroom Walls, and you do it really beautifully here with Leo. So Leo's, what I wanna know about this story is, did the story happen to you first, or did the character of Leo and his anxiety happen before you started writing the story? Like, which comes first for you, the plot or the character? Ooh. Okay, so for this story, Leo came first. He, um, I mean, I took a lot, I put a lot of myself into him and a lot of my own experience with him. So it was really easy for the plot to kind of flow through him once he was a 
once he was already fully formed in my head. So I think that's how it happened. I think like it was probably like very quickly Leo and then plot. So <laughs> that's how I remember it. And did you always know that you wanted him to have this level of anxiety? Like are those, are those issues that they seem paramount to you in your writing? Yeah, I think when when I started this story, it felt like he was going to be a mirror for me and it made perfect sense for him to just kind of embody all of that. It uh, it just all it all came together that way that he would be um, that his anxiety would be part of the story and it would be woven throughout. Um, yeah, with the knitting and crocheting and all that just woven together. <laughs> and at what point did you when you were writing the story, at what point did you realize that you were actually writing a love story of sorts? That didn't come until maybe um, once I figured out the uh, the family uh, the family curse or family drama kind of situation, and right. then and then it kind I kind of eased into that once I realized this, the direction that the story was going. To go. Then it then the love story evolved at that point. Now, I know that you said that writing uh, Words on Bathroom Walls took about nine months to write. Mm -hmm. And if I, I'm going to quote directly from our chat, <laughs> a lot of people talk about the sophomore novel, the second book, which is not technically this is your third book. But we can talk about it later. Um, they talk about how that's the hardest book to write. And you said, just our luck, writing just our luck was like chewing glass. Yeah. And you, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Because like the writing life is not always uh, glamorous. No, it's not yeah. always glam. This was a hard, the second one was hard to get right. Um, it, it was, there were a lot of starts and stops throughout. <laughs> um, it took a really long time to get into the rhythm of the story. And it was two, I think two years total, I think from the time that after it was, cause we had started talking about the second book before uh, Words on Bathroom Walls published. So it was two years from like before uh, that published to when it actually became a story that, um, that we could work with. Um, but it took a long time to get it right. And it was um, like a conversation between me and my editor at the time where it's like, oh, this isn't almost, but it doesn't feel like it's the complete story yet. And it was, it was hard. There was a lot of, um, there was a lot of back and forth that, um, and I couldn't, it was frustrating because I couldn't seem to get uh, Leo's whole story out. I couldn't seem to write the, like, nothing was coming together the way I wanted to until finally it clicked with one draft we could move forward and i'm yeah. not even sure what that magical moment was like i just know that at that moment it felt like such a relief to be able to write the story and to get the whole thing on paper and get it all out so yeah but it was not easy it was not the same as um as writing words on bathroom walls and i had kids i was writing drafts on my phone like yeah. they were, I was writing it in the notes app of my phone and sending it to myself so that I could put it into a word document later and doing it while I was nursing a baby and then trying to distract a toddler. It was just all over the place. Everything, everything changes when you're, when you're a creative person and suddenly you become a parent and a lot of you know, your energy has to go in like a lot of different directions at once. And, and I was really impressed when you told me that you were using the notes app. But I mean, you do what you have to do. Like, you, super you glamorous. To, you, it's like survival <laughs> of the fittest. Because I had an I had a friend once who's a writer who told me, you know, I am a better parent when I have writing time. When I don't have writing time, I have all this stuff inside, and I can't get my creativity out, and I'm a frustrated person. And I'm a I'm a better parent to my kids when I've had an hour or 15 minutes or just a couple of times a day to like jot down some notes. It, everything is so much better. And she, you know, and she was like, it's just so important that you have like a little bit of time to carve it out, even if it's just doing it, you know, on the notes app. And I'm very impressed that you can do that in that form. It is, it is not, it's not easy. It's kind of just, it was how, how I was able to get things out before I forgot <laughs> like as things were happening throughout the day. 
Um, but yeah, it worked. I mean, it seemed to work. My preference is to write for hours in a library undisturbed, but, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it seems to work out and I'm able to, uh, I'm able to squeeze in like little pieces of time when I can't get, like when I can't get, uh, either, uh, my mom or my mother-in-law or uh, my husband to like, here you go for like an hour so I can do, <laughs> so I can write some things down. Um, because I'm lucky enough that I do have um, chunks of time from, from my mom, my mother-in-law, my husband at certain times. But, um, you know, during the day, if I, if I think of something, it's got to be like real quick on my, in my phone. Yeah. And because you tackled um, schizophrenia and words on bathroom walls and you discuss anxiety in Just Our Luck, what kind of research do you put into that? Because we have a responsibility particularly because we're writing for teens to make right. sure that the representation, I mean, everyone's mileage is going to vary. Leo's experience won't be everyone's experience, but we have a responsibility to make sure that there's some accurate representation. So how do you go about doing that when you're writing the book? So it, for words on bathroom walls, it was, um, it was a lot of library research where I would sit there with medical journals with, articles that I had found online with, um, at one point I was also um, looking at um, handbooks for um, family members who were trying to help um, people within their family, uh, you know, with treatment for, for the illness. Um, I did have one beta reader who, um, did exp who uh, was schizophrenic and was reading it for uh, representation to see how, um, how much, uh, know how close it was and if the representation was accurate and um but a lot of it was uh a lot of it was online research at the time um and then read and you know uh articles that i can get my hands on uh for uh leos and then also obviously um talking to i had um, doctors that i was consulting about the clinical trial aspect mm -hmm. of it as well to see how realistic um, I could get that within the framework of the novel because um, the drug that I invented for words on bathroom walls is actually um, a mix of all of the drugs that were on the market. All the side effects that um, Adam experienced were side effects from all of the drugs that were currently were were being used at the time to treat patients with schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And so when I went sent out to write Just Our Luck, because I was basing Leo's anxiety on my own anxiety, it was a lot of just telling things honest speaking honestly and talking about it the way like as clearly as I could about my own experience but we also talked to um to a few to a one no two two therapists and uh and um a few and then a couple doctors who consulted on it when we were um in the editing phases as well who uh read through it and then helped answer my questions about um all of the things that Leo might have also been struggling with internally that I might want to um, to highlight in the story to make it uh, to pull pull the anxiety all the way through the novel in a way that gave him, I guess, more um, more tools to deal with it by the end. Yeah. One thing that I love too about Leo is that what you do so beautifully in the book is you give Leo and therefore the reader these tools to manage anxiety but also the layer of grief that goes a little bit unrecognized that leo doesn't recognize you know and you note this in your author's note to the book that this is like a layer of trauma that he hasn't fully come to terms with yet his mother's death when he was four i love that you give these tools like crocheting and hot yoga so that a reader who's feeling like leo could say maybe i can do those things to help me like get through those like really anxious times. Yeah, it was important for me to, I mean, to make it to, make it as close to my own, my own toolbox as, like for my own stuff. So yoga has really helped as has, has really helped. I haven't been able to do hot yoga for a while. And obviously with the pandemic, it's not, you can't really get into studios right now. So right. we've been doing at home actually in the last few weeks, we've been doing it together. Um, not quite as peaceful and relaxing doing it with small children, but, um, but also, um, crocheting and knitting is very, very helpful. Having that, like, I don't know, that rhythmic motion with your hands, the distraction, the, the, the thought of making something else, 
um because i used to make um worked in insurance we were actually crocheting hats for um for children with cancer and mm -hmm. we would send them into the hospitals when we were done so we did that for a long time and making things and then giving them to people afterwards i don't know there's something very it's very nice it's very it's a relief to be able to do that so it does help i do recommend that oh we lost your uh picture are you still hello i'm still here can you hear me i can hear you okay am i gone okay. um, can everyone still see julia can someone pop in the chat box okay great okay awesome so we did talk about um the type of writers that we are when we had our chat earlier and you said that you are a fastidious outliner instead of being a pantser which is someone who just writes the book like straight through without thinking about it yeah um so i mean i've got an outline it's not probably not as detailed as other writers but i really need to have a direction i need to have the beginning and the end and i need to have a few points in the middle and i like to draw a bell curve with um colored pencils and to make it really pretty once I have all of the points that I want in the story. Um, but I do leave for, you know, the, the, for the spirit to take me wherever it needs to go like while I am reading. Um, but I like to have an outline. I really do. It's, uh, I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine pantsing it through, through a novel. It makes me, that makes, that makes me anxious thinking about it's not okay. having. It's not like, that bad. <laughs> well, like when you do it, like when you, do you really do you really just sit down and go like how does how does it go how does it go uh pretty much it's i get myself to 300 pages like i have to so 100 pages 300 pages I go, just... I go all the way to 300 pages like we talked about it i don't like chapter headings i will just type yeah. the whole thing like i've thought about the story in my head for a long time and i take notes in a composition book and then okay. And then I find I have to think about the main character and I listen to a lot of music and then I find the song that is the main character and then I start writing the story and I only listen to that one song the entire time. Whoa. It's you really didn't tell me that before that magic. I mean, you know, we talked about it too. I, I started in poetry, so I'm like, you know, yes. I can go forever, you know, and I, I, I'm very obsessive and I can I can write forever and I don't I don't worry about it, but I had a writing teacher once who said, you don't, you can't, you cannot work on anything until you have at least 300 pages. And probably your real story is going to reveal itself somewhere in the middle of that first draft. Wow. And then you can go back and like clean everything out and then you know what your story is. But it's, then we talked about it too, like I said that in novel writing workshops, you're critiquing like the first 30 pages and they haven't yeah. written the book. And then all these writers are like, well, everyone, you know, they're really critical of this and they don't want to go on. And I was like, yeah. give me 300 pages. See, no, when we spoke, I don't remember you saying 300 pages. And when I hear <laughs> yeah. that, it's just that like, wow, I can't imagine, like right, even right now, I can't imagine sitting for the, being able to sit and write the 300 pages straight after letting it just like simmer in my brain. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, my, <laughs> my, my, Mine doesn't work that way. I, you know, I did, I did. I had a very strict outline, though, for a very specific book that I can't talk about yet. And I enjoyed working with that outline. I enjoyed working with it a lot because then I was like, okay, this is what I have to do next. And that rained me in. But also, you know, I write highly emotional books. And so mm -hmm. I, will, I will go way out there. And so that it works better for me with that type of book. Wow. <laughs> but yeah and i mean that works too with the way that your headings go don't have the to flow like the yeah. flow of your novels girl in pieces you have like it really was it was i mean oh i mean you could just sense the poetry background with that yeah. so just the way that the story flowed was just so unbelievably beautiful right. just that makes that makes sense that makes sense to your style so um Words on bathroom walls. I do want to talk about this because I know a lot of people are very interested in it. Was made into a movie. And do you want to talk about like what that was like and you know, 
do you feel like the movie is, is the vision of your book or do you feel like it had to deviate in some ways? I mean, what was that whole process like for you? Incredible. I mean, just really, sometimes I wake up and I still can't believe that that actually happened. But um, as far as the story, um, I'm friends with the screenwriter now. But when he wrote the first draft, um, he, uh, he, I mean, it deviates a little bit from the book. There are places where I think that he removed things to make it a more, you know, visual experience for author, I mean, for not for authors, sorry, for audiences. Um, but I was okay with it. It felt like um, his take on the story was actually still pretty true to the heart of the story. There were a few things that, um, there were a few things that were different, but it, it, uh, it's, it worked. And uh, I was really happy with it. And th with the, the cast, um, I mean, just, be I mean, beautiful. The actors did such an amazing job bringing it to life. And then um, to have Andy Garcia play like a priest that I wrote, I mean, that's just like, how, I mean, that never would have crossed my mind ever in ever. I Who guess. doesn't love Andy Garcia? Let's say that again. Who doesn't love Andy Garcia? Who? I don't. I just. Remember when the world was Andy Garcia and you're like, he was in everything. And he was in he, everything. Now he's back. You have yeah. sing, single handedly brought back Andy Garcia. Good for me. Because I know. That's just public service. You're welcome, everyone. <laughs> One thing I, I, like to, I like to ask authors about is you have like some beautiful covers especially this one yes. and some people they don't know that authors don't get a choice in their covers and that sometimes you go through like a ton of covers mm -hmm. and you know hopefully the marketing team decides on one that they like and you're happy with it so tell me about your cover experience for both books god i was so incredibly lucky with both experiences that they just turned out beautifully with words on bathroom walls i remember all that i said and this was just me like in my Eve little uh, debut mind where I'm just like, I just want graffiti and I'd like there to be a script that looks handwritten. And they just blew me away. They did the whole, like exactly how I would have pictured it if I had that kind of um, artistic talent for covers and was able to convey what I wanted from my brain to a cover. It was just beautiful. I was really happy. And then with um, Just Our Luck, same thing. It was, I'd like to have um, the Mati on the cover somewhere, which is the, the eye right here right. and then uh the yarn and the knitting needles um there's just there's so much going on here that i was so happy with and the colors i mean yeah, yeah i mean i got really lucky i think i just got really lucky because i have heard from other writers that there was a long back and forth with um with their with their vision for the cover and then what yeah. it ended up finally being um yeah and I just, I didn't have that, I didn't have that problem with either book. So hopefully that continues forever and it's just smooth sailing. But um, yeah, I was lucky. Just incredibly talented people who worked on my covers. So we have um, seven questions in our ask a question box. But first, before we go to that, I just wanna know, do you have writing advice for people? Uh, yeah, so, um, my favorite piece of advice to give people is um, keep your eyes on your own paper and uh, don't compare yourself to anyone else because it's it's just not going to do you any good. There will be those moments where you are searching through either Instagram or Twitter or Facebook and you'll see some like we like when we when we spoke about it, like you'll find some somebody in high school or somebody that you uh, once knew from school. And they're doing something like, oh, they're getting, they've got this amazing new job or they've got this amazing new house and they've got, and you just, you can't compare your own experiences with someone else's experiences. You really have to focus on the things that you want to do and don't let yourself be sidelined by this longing for what other people have. Um, and then with writing, it's just, just write, just write until, just write until you have nothing left of a story in you until it's all out on paper and don't don't get distracted by other people's success or other what's going on in other people's lives it is it's very hard because you know there's always somebody who's like a better book deal who sold more books who gets like oh all movies or tv shows or it just looks like everything is great and they have a better mm -hmm. house 
and then that's really that's it's harmful to your mental health. And it, what back of the book in your author's note, and this part actually made me cry because this is what writing is all about, especially when you're writing a book primarily for teenagers. You said, just find what works for you and go for it. Don't let anyone make you feel small for taking care of your mental health. And I feel like that's something that we should all think about when we're trying to be creative or just get through the day. Take care of yourself first. There's always gonna be somebody whose life looks much shinier than yours, but yours is the one that you have to worry about and take care of yourself and don't let all that bad, that small stuff turn into like big stuff. Okay, you ready for questions? I'm ready. Okay, what inspired you? Hold on. This is a question from Angelica. What inspired you to write Just Our Luck? Uh, this was very much the book that I wish that I had been able to read when I was in high school. Um, I just, I didn't, there were many things about uh, my anxiety I didn't know how to address. And so much of it felt like me not wanting to admit weakness or not wanting to admit that I was feeling overwhelmed. Um, I guess not even wanting to address, you know, what was going on in my head at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so this was the book, this was really, this is an homage to my anxiety, to uh, who I was in high school. And I wrote it because I needed to. That was, <laughs> the, that was the story that needed to come out for that girl in high school. Well, that's beautiful. Okay, <laughs> question two. What is your favorite childhood book? Ooh, this is hard, man. Uh, okay, so there was one summer uh, when I read all of Roald Dahl's books, um, like all of them. Mm -hmm. And I would be, I would have to say Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Um, oh, but Bruce Coville's Jeremy Hatcher Dragon Hatcher was like at the point where I was really getting into books too. So can I just mess a tie between those okay. two? Because that would be, that was before everything else. That was that whole summer of Roald Dahl and then Bruce Coville led me from Jeremy Thatcher, Dragon Hatcher to all of the alien books and all of like, yeah, those two. Okay. I think those were really important. What is your daily writing schedule like? Do you write? <laughs> You write or something related every day. God, I wish. I wish that I had um, a really beautiful schedule that I could show you that's, you know, color coded and stuff. But really, it's just whenever I have people that I can swindle into watching my children. And that's gotten <laughs> that's gotten harder with, uh, you know, everything that's going on in the world um, these last years. Has it been years? It feels like years. Maybe it feels just like years. It feels yeah. like you're, um, but uh, it's whenever I have time where when the kids are sleeping, if they all nap at the same time, then that's like a miracle. Um, <laughs> and then I immediately can sit down and make a list of all the scenes that I have to write and then find a way to blend them in later. But I either, and if they are asleep, then I can actually write in a notebook, which is nice. So I'll do that and then I will transfer it later because I do like, I do like my notebook writing. When do I get you get a lot of sleep, like personally? Say that again. Do I get a lot of sleep? I get a lot of sleep personally? Yeah. I don't. I don't get as much as I'd like. Um, I would. I much like. And my littlest, my youngest, is just one at the end of December, and he just decided that he is going to sleep. Like he, he had a nine-month regression, and then just decided now that he's a, he's cool with sleeping for most of the night. So we we've turned a corner. We're doing okay now. But it was <laughs> rough there for a while, and he doesn't nap well either. So yeah. lucky he's cute. He's very lucky he's cute. <laughs> That's a good redeeming quality, cuteness. Okay. I love him, but ah, oh, sleep. Yeah. How long did it take you take for you to write your most recent book? Oh, my most recent book. Mm -hmm. So not. Oh, um. Okay. Hmm. We didn't talk about your third book. So. Well, yeah, the third book. Um, 
That one was quick. I would say that that is like the whole first draft was maybe like four or five months. Um, and I only had one kid at the time while I was drafting that one. So that would, that would be four or five months total. Yeah. Four, what? Four or five months? Just for the draft. It wasn't pretty or anything yet, but the whole idea was completely formed and like out into something. So, and then it took, and then there were several revisions, but that whole draft was out of me within four or five months. I need you to yeah. write more books for me and no. make my editor love me for writing like really quickly. <laughs> oh, but it's like not, it's not all together yet though, by the end of those four months. See, it takes a lot of, yeah. No, <laughs> it's not, it does take a long time to get pretty after that, but yeah, at least it was out. <laughs> okay. What part of this book or scene brought you the most joy and which one was the most challenging? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, without being too spoilery, um, I think it's a scene with Leo's father. As Leo's towards... father. He's a tough one. Yeah. Leo's father, um, Tough. Yeah, I think that there's a scene towards the end with Leo and his father, and I did enjoy that. And that's all that I can say because I don't want to like ruin it for you guys. But then the other scene, uh, I, I enjoyed the yoga scenes a lot. <laughs> those ones were those ones were fun because it brought me back to the beginning of doing yoga and to being really bad in the yeah. beginning at everything. Um, and then by the end of like of doing it for about a year, I remember just being so proud of myself for being able to get into a really great squirrel pose, the mm -hmm. flying squirrel mm -hmm. pose and crow pose. Um, and then being able to like completely do a handstand without like wobbling. Can't do that now, but at the time I could. So that was amazing. Um, but I liked those scenes. Those were fun to write. Okay. What is your favorite snack while writing? Oh. Okay, so for like hardcore editing, if I've got a lot to do, then I need like a full box of sushi um, or a California burrito, which if you're not familiar with what a California burrito is, yeah. it is a, car a carnitas burrito filled yeah. with, it's got French fries in it and mm -hmm. it's got, it's got guacamole and avocado and onions and tomatoes and all that good stuff. And it's usually like as big as my face. Um, that's some serious writing food and like it's a California thing. How do you not spill that all over your pages? Um, um, I've learned to eat very quickly and quietly when my kids are sleeping. But actually, I've always been able to just kind of like very quickly. So, yeah, my pages have been lucky thus far. But there is the, you know, once in a while, there is the uh, evidence of um, lunch <laughs> on the early pages. Oops. Okay. Do you have advice for teens who have a friend with anxiety? Any advice on how to better understand how they react to things? Oh, so, I mean, it's very sweet um, to ask for, um, I mean, if somebody else that you know is dealing with anxiety, I mean, you just encourage them to do healthy things for them. But it's very difficult because people have to make those decisions for themselves about how how to help themselves get through it. Um, but even just suggesting small things, even like suggesting things like um, like yoga, like meditation, like activities that help um, distract your mind a little bit so that they can figure out what's going on in their own head and figure out how to ask you know, themselves the questions about how they wanna go about health or seeking treatment, depending on, depending on how severe it is. Right. Um, yeah, um, just keep keeping an open dialogue and talking with your friend about it, talking with your friend, talking yeah. through it. That's the most important thing. Yeah, I think listening without judgment. Like sometimes yeah, people, yeah. people jump in with their own, you know, idea of how people should handle something and really um, being a good listener and being there for your friend. That's all important stuff too. Yeah, okay. What other mental illnesses would you like to address in your novels? You know, I'm not sure that I've ever um, been asked a question like that. I think if 
if it comes up in the next story, then it will be part of the character from the beginning. Right. And then the story will just kind of evolve from there. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. If it, if the character, if that's the way that the story comes to me, then that's how it'll develop. I feel like you and I are yeah. similar in the <laughs> sense that we've used some of our personal experiences with mental illness yeah. or in our life that filters through our novels to some extent, but it's not mm -hmm. that we started out saying, I'm going to write a book about this. It's just that this is where yeah. we come from. Yeah. And it just <laughs> happens organically. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good question. Definitely. Do you journal on a regular basis? Oh, you know what happens is that I will be really good for like a month solid and then something will happen. And then I look back at a journal and be like, huh, how did I get distracted after journaling for every day for a month? And then yeah, it's uh, so sometimes I guess the answer to that question is sometimes that I'm really good. And uh, when I was in school and I had to, like there were certain uh, certain times when would when we would be asked to keep yeah. a journal or asked to, then I was great because then it's required and I have to do it. But when it's me, like it's and just doing it on my own, then I'm not as good. So I do have periods of time for like, like there will be a month, a chunk of like a month where you can see where I've written every single day. And then you wonder like, what happened on that 30th day? Like where you stopped doing it completely. So yeah, sometimes, sometimes I journal. I do love that, that Leo is assigned to keep a journal when he starts hot yeah. yoga. And that, yeah. you know, the journal entries appear in there and they're just so funny, especially when he starts hot yoga and he's like, I'm just this sweating, liquefying puddle <laughs> in the floor and i would like to be back there by the you know in the back left hand corner of the room by the air vent vent which is me yeah. when I do high yoga, but they won't let me <laughs> so oh. i really love it and i love too yeah. that his journal entries also they cover the new poses that he's trying as he goes along which is great. yeah people really underestimate the sweat for hot yoga when they haven't did like when you haven't done it just it's it's a lot <laughs> it's a lot in the beginning I have seen you get over it, but I have seen strong people be beaten down by their first hot yoga session. Like they have they have no idea. You're okay. just crawling out by the end. But then <laughs> you get used to it and then you keep coming back for some reason. It's uh but yeah, there's a lot. Okay. You are completely drained when you leave. What was your path to publication like? Oh, well, I think um a lot of rejection. Uh, I wrote four novels. The fourth one is the, is Words on Bathroom Walls, the ones that got published. So the three before that um, went nowhere and sit on a shelf and they were rightfully rejected because they weren't ready. But I was rejected by hundreds of agents for those three. And yeah. I remember just, because I sent them out, just, mm -hmm. you know, you finish a novel, you send it out, you see what happens. Um, rejected, rejected, rejected. And just keep going. Um, and then fine. And then I, once I wrote words in bathroom walls, it felt different. It was an easier draft to write, and I felt like I had Adam's voice like down. I it, it, there were no blocks for writing the whole story. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote that entire first draft, and then I remember I had I had a group of friends read it, and they came over for brunch, and we did like a critique, like uh, kind of. They were my editing council at the time, and it was really fun. And we all talked about it, and then a couple weeks later. We, I sent it out to agents and I only got like maybe 10 rejections before I got a request and then signed. Yeah. And, and then a month later I got my um, offer from Random House. So that was pretty quick, but Amazing. it was four, but it was three years of rejection before that. And then after writing this one. So it was quick for this particular book, but it had been a long time where I had been just continuously rejected. So. It, you just yeah. have, to keep, you have to keep trying because, yeah, um, you know, some agents are naturally not going to feel like they can represent your book because that's not the type of book exactly. that they can represent. It's not like their genre right. or their their plot line. And so you you have to move right. on. And I think that if you if you stick with it, you're going to find the agent who can really be the champion for the story that you want to tell. Yeah, a hundred percent agree. It's um, and you only need the one yes. So you've just gotta yeah. really find that person that connects. And 
yeah, if you're, and just keep going until you find it. And it feels really good when you do find that one person who just like gets it, who gets the story and is really excited to represent you. That's the cool, that's the good stuff. <laughs> do you, uh, do you want to talk about your third book a little bit? Can you talk about it? I can't really talk about it yet because it hasn't been like announced or anything. So right. there will be a third book. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I have to wait to like announce it, but I'm really psyched about it and like really excited about it. Yeah. So just, yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's all, I think that's all I can say. And do you have any um, last words about Just Our Luck or words on bathroom walls? Anything that you want readers to think about when they're reading the book or what you hope they would come away with from Leo's story in particular? Um, you know, I hope that um, kids who read this book or really any book about mental illness um, or about anxiety uh, feel like reading these kinds of, uh, you know, opening yourself up to these kinds of stories gives you the opportunity to be less, um, less afraid to open up about your own struggles and that you see these characters and you read about and read about them and that it becomes less, I guess, less taboo to discuss, um, that, pe pe that readers start feeling more comfortable talking about it. Okay. That's, that's my goal. I want them to feel more comfortable about it. All right, we're gonna do a lightning round now because I think we have like seven minutes. Are you ready? Woo, ready. Never outline or you can't think about it. You just have to answer it. Oh God, this is gonna be terrible. Okay, go ahead. All right, favorite movie? Oh, When Harry Met Sally. Favorite food? Burritos. Shoot, sushi. Favorite book? <laughs> Favorite book? Uh, a Christmas Carol. Which Chris? As in Chris Pratt, Chris Evans. You know the three Chris's, Hemsworth. Can you do it? Can you do it? Okay. Uh, Hemsworth. That's an excellent it's Hemsworth. point. It's always oh. Hemsworth. Someone says, Chris <laughs> Evans, Julia. Oh, that's my sister. He's Captain America, so that's legit. But yeah, um, so okay. Yeah, I think coffee Thor or tea? Wins. Coffee, tea in the afternoon. Sorry, that's movies in the afternoon or a movie <laughs> at night in the theater. Night, night. Oh, night. Are you sure about that? Night. I'm t I'm a hundred percent sure because if I do a daytime movie and come out and it's still daytime, I'm completely weirded out. Like the whole day has just morphed into another. I just yeah, it's got. We've be been movie. we've been in lockdown since March. Are you wearing pajama pants right now? They're yoga pants, not pajama pants, but yeah, they're comfortable. What is the so longest you've gone without washing <laughs> your hair during lockdown? Oh, I wash my hair every day. That's, really? mm, mm -mm. That's amazing. Yeah, really, I have to. All right. <laughs> Favorite band? I don't have one. I know. I, I okay. don't have one. Favorite singer? I know. It's going to be. A singer can be different than a band. A band is people. A singer is soul. I know, but but maybe I'm just kind of like. I listened to Disney songs all day long and I've forgotten. Favorite Disney song? Uh, oh, almost there. It's from. Uh, it's not Let It Go? Pop. No, I'm, I'm done with Let It Go. <laughs> done with it. <laughs> so I wait every day. It's like. <laughs> You've let Let It Go go. You have let go. I've let it go. It is gone. It is so let it gone. I can't. Mm. Oh, Ed Sheeran. My sister just said Ed Sheeran. She's right. You like Ed Sheeran? Yeah. I do like Ed Sheeran. She's right. Okay. I'm sorry. Favorite, a... favorite TV show? Ooh, I have a lot. But I watched West Wing a lot, and I liked uh, Downton Abbey, and I liked Sherlock for a long time. But I have not. Oh, the British Breaking Show. The Great British Breaking Show is my favorite show of all time. Right. I only just started watching that like this summer and I went through like all the seasons on Netflix that are yeah, on. Isn't it lovely? It like, it put me, it like 
it's so gentle and they're so nice to each other. And sweet. And it's all about baking. And then they're just so nice and everything yes. in the voices. And then it's I got to like the, I got to Noel Fielding and I have like a giant crush on Noel Fielding now because there's this lankiness and then the goth thing. And I'm like, why can that person not be my boyfriend? I should have a boyfriend like that. And I go into these long, anyway. It's and I put, it on, I put it on in the background when I'm writing. Me too. I can do baking show for, see, there we go. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. And it's just so, <laughs> my mom. <laughs> My mom just commented, sometimes Paul Hollywood can be a little tough. Mom. <laughs> but that's Paul's thing. He's the best, but, you know. And I, you know, I do but, wonder too when I'm writing something, like, what would Paul Hollywood say about my plot? <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's a bit, you know, it's a bit doughy. It's it's not it's, done in the middle. You know what I mean? Like, right? You could have baked this longer, Kathleen. You could have. You could have. <laughs> exactly. Like, Think about what an oh. editor he would be on your book. Oh my gosh, that's so true. Yeah. But yeah, I love it. Love it. Oh and I, I totally miss Mary Berry. Oh, me too. I loved her. We have a cat fighting. And he has the Kitties. most important question. Okay. Cats, dogs, or all fuzzy creatures? Oh, oh. all fuzzy creatures. He agrees with that. I, I do too. Yeah, I love cats and dogs and. Other, well, I mean, as far as pets, though, um, yeah, I would do cat, uh, cats and dogs. You can't, I can't. They're different personalities. Yeah. yeah. You know, I have cats and dogs and a bearded dragon because my daughter has a bearded dragon and she has a tortoise at her other house. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so cool. I know. There's, and she has four parakeets. Anyway, she loves animals. I, you know, I would probably, even though I have cats, I would probably have to go a little bit in the dog direction. Ooh. See, okay. if I had to choose, then I lean more cat, but I also <laughs> love dogs. So yeah. I do lean, like, my personality-wise is I'm very, like, much a cat person. They approach me from, you know, they know. It's like they know that I'm with them and that I get it. So, I don't yeah. think I'm allowed okay. to say anything but cat given my current <laughs> mechanism. Otherwise, I think the overlord of the house would then unleash his wrath on me. And I don't want to sleep in fear tonight. So I'm 100% a cat person who loves all fuzzy creatures. <laughs> okay, but you know that if you were in danger, like a dog, a dog would be like, and a cat would be like, eh. Okay. Eat your eyeballs. That'd be the first thing. But you really, you eat your eyeballs when you're dead because they'd be like, "Oh, you left me a snack. Thank you." <laughs> Sad. They're so resourceful, though. That's very resourceful. I mean, so he gets points for being like survivor ninja, but then if it's about my survival, dog totally. Wins. <laughs> but I, yeah. Look at it, so fluffy. But I had to pop back on because. Okay. Kitty, hi. I have the unfortunate job of having to end the event because we are at yield hour mark. But um, my last question for both of you is that um, I know you can't always talk about stuff that's coming out. Julia, I know you said you can't really talk about book number three. But I wanted to ask Not really. if there's anything else in the pipelines or anything that you can or would like to share with audiences. And then also where they can stalk you on social media so that they can keep up to date with everything. <laughs> Woohoo! Um, so I'm on Instagram and Twitter, and it's jwalt at jwaltonwrites. Mm -hmm. um, as far as projects coming up, um, I can't really talk about it yet, but I will have news soonish. Um, so Yay. follow me on those places and I will post it. Um, and hopefully other stuff in the future, you know, more YA, maybe middle grade, maybe other fun stuff. I'm, uh, you know, just, I'm, I'm excited and hopefully, um, yeah, hopefully I'll have, uh, hopefully we'll have like schools open and stuff so that I get more, <laughs> more writing time for those kind of things. But yeah. So I have a book coming out in September, 2021, next fall called You'd Be Home Now which is about a girl whose brother comes back from rehab and she's tasked by their mother to be his keeper and keep him sober, which is uh, too much of a responsibility for a 16 year old girl. Yeah. And she's developed her own 
background of secrets that she needs to keep to compensate. It's about that. And then I have another book uh, coming out in 2022, I think. So I have two more books coming up, plus a secret project that I can't announce yet, which is the well, weird. The secret projects have secrets. me intrigued just by the very nature of secrets. And that's the one that I, that's the one I went through, <laughs> you know, using an outline. <laughs> but um, you can find me on Twitter <gasps> at Kathleen Glasgow, and then on Instagram at Miss Kathleen Glasgow. And if you go to my website www.kathleenglasgowbooks.com, I have an email, and if you want to email me, I will answer you back. And you can also find my PO box because I will write a letter back to you if you write to me. Oh, that is amazing! And also, too, the new book you were able to talk about sounds amazing. That is a hefty responsibility in that. That just sounds like a really great book that is going to also help a lot of people as your book well both of both and all of your books julia and kathleen i mean it's really nice to see the representation Thanks. and the openness of what you discuss in books for teens because a lot of the times that stuff is kind of it's opening up a little bit but it's still kept super kind of yeah. quiet and uncomfortable so thank you for giving a voice and giving a platform and for opening up the conversation for these things because it it's insanely important and um so just a big thank you from me for you guys for doing that and oh, for sharing the evening with us and yeah thanks thank you so much for having thank us come. thank you for it was having great. Us. such a pleasure thank, and thank you, you kathleen us. okay so we will say thank you thank you guys everyone. thank you sorry for the flying cat hair thank you for joining bye. us bye you guys and <laughs> we will see you guys thank you so the next much event. don't forget if you want to purchase any of the author's books there is the purchase book button down below mm -hmm. and you'll get book plates from not one, but both authors, if you purchase both of their books. Oh my gosh, it's so special. But thank you so much for joining <laughs> and the amazing conversations. And we will see you guys next time. Have a good thank night, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.